to start the, the closing session. I think everyone is here. So good afternoon to all of you. Um, we are good. We will do uh, quite a, a quick closing session because I know that uh, some of you already have uh, flights or a journey, you know, what trips uh, in, in Lyon. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, welcome and uh, to introduce you to uh, France Legaré. She is a colleague, she is a friend, uh, close friend since uh, more uh, than uh, 10 years ago now. And uh, she's going to uh, present you after doing some photos. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, it's for tweeters. I'm going to talk about tweeters. Uh, so she's going to uh, uh, make an overview of um, the works and all of, uh, that has been discussed and uh, exchanged during this conference, and also focus on uh, shared decision making in Canada. And the from priorities at the policy level. At the policy that level. That would be in our mindset. Absolutely. So. Donc, bonjour tout le monde, je vais commencer en français parce que pour moi c'est important de remercier nos autres, Nora euh, et toute euh, l'équipe, parce qu'on a été accueillis vraiment avec euh, euh, non seulement de la chaleur et beaucoup de sourires, mais avec des gros cadeaux, comme d'aller euh, souper chez M. Bocus, mm. je vais m'en souvenir toute euh, ma vie. Merci infiniment. Sachez que du côté du Québec, on, on est toujours euh, en admiration avec euh, nos cousins français. Et donc, vous êtes très important pour nous. Puis, on vous aime beaucoup. Donc, merci beaucoup de votre accueil, Shannon. So, <laughs> merci. So, now I'm going to change in my southern language. So, now I have an accent, which I didn't have just now, hein, Nora? <laughs> okay. So, I've kind of uh, built this presentation, which was finished at 11 this morning. So I'm going to see it at the same time as you for the first time. <laughs> and uh, I built it with three uh, components. One of it is what Nora had maybe suggested I would do is to have an overview of what uh, as a synthesis uh, had been happening in the past uh, few days. And um, it has two components that I actually built from uh, Victor's uh, suggestion. That this group is about being a social group or a family and also a company or a business. And the third one is what uh, also Nora mentioned, is maybe give some uh, very brief uh, suggestion uh, of what I can perceive in the policymaking uh, environment of Canada and some of our province where shared decision making could have a unique contribution. So Victor said that this was a club. So here we go to give some evidence to this idea of a club.
that was for the club team. <laughs> so I can see to you all. So if you ever want to know, this is all in there. And it also is very helpful to have a, a jet lag because I couldn't sleep. And uh, that was helpful to have a little bit uh, more time for preparing for, for today while I was here. So now let's do the business part of it and the company part of it. So the way I, uh, I, uh, I, I work over this, and I will apologize uh, because at first I'm a Canadian, we always apologize. Uh, and second, because I couldn't do it the way I would have liked to do it. So um, you cannot remove a systematic reviewer once you've, you've been one. So I systematically reviewed the overall abstract since I've been here. And I was fortunate in being in some room. So um, there's 132 of them, actually, even if uh, the, the oral section is about 150, because some take two pages. But there was a workshop, so I removed it because it was not eligible. I was looking for the, the studies. So I was left with 131. And that's interesting to compare that maybe 12 years ago, because I have the first abstract that maybe was uh, electronically uh, dis uh, uh, available, is the Ottawa one. It was 92 at the time, so we can see an uh, increase, at least from the overall abstract, of about 30%. What I did is I did an extraction. <laughs> And um, again, as I said, it helps sometimes not to sleep well. So, um, so I, I, I try to get the gist of what some of these, uh, each one of these overall abstract was all about. And this is, and again, I have no pretension that there is no mistake here, but this is what I got from uh, what I extracted. So out of those 131, uh, there was decision-making process, uh, that was the core uh, focus of it, Implementation of solution making, decision aid development, decision aid efficacy, and you can read it down to not clear for one. That may be because I was sleepy. <laughs> and again, if you compare with the abstract book of Ottawa in 205, in relative percentage, with no machine except my sleepy brain, I kind of got the guess that in 205 there was more presentation on theory, less on implementation, decision aids were much more prominent in the, the presentation, and there was only one uh, team, team approach uh, study that was uh, proposed. As for the study design, um, and again, I'm sure there are mistakes, and maybe the colleague in the room that asked about grade yesterday, is he here with us? Somebody in the room is very interested. No, I didn't put, I didn't go great here. Uh, so very uh, many cross-sectional, qualitative, systematic review, many. Systematic review include any knowledge synthesis. So environmental scan, realist review, etc. Mixed method, randomized clinical trial, cluster, experts consensus, pilot RCT, measurement study that I kind of left uh, on the side. Not clear, before, after, and one case study, and I put it in red. There was one that I found quite interesting, which was applying the James Lean Alliance technique. It was from the Cardiff group, because again, this is very high on the priority uh, list of uh, uh, Canadian policymakers, and there was a, such a presentation this week. And one thing that, again, I found difficult to do, and I'm just very humbly proposing it to you, is I think we need a reporting guideline for abstract. And uh, maybe that's something that somebody would like to, to do for Equator, for abstract of this conference, because that was quite difficult sometimes to get the gist, because there's no reporting, uh, uh, there's no structure that is easy to pick up. Clinical area. I'm just uh, presenting you those with uh, the most frequently, uh, uh, those that were the most frequently observed. So um, the most frequently observed is when clinical area was either all, you know, in primary care, we see everything, or multiple, and I didn't have time to put all the disease one by one, or not clear. Elderly, including dementia, cancer, breast cancer, so I distinguished it from cancer because it was so prominent. Cardiovascular disease, disease mental health, be careful, it does not include the symposium on mental health. Uh, chronic kidney disease and diabetes. And there was multiple others, but they would have appeared only once or twice. 
And I just wanted to make, you know, a bit of a benchmark. Again, it's not perfect, but that's what I had on hand, which is the characteristic of included studies of our update of the Cochrane uh, review on implementing decision making. We have now a 63 study, and want to say thank you to Reda Ajepu, uh, our PhD student who's uh, leading it right now, because there was some concordance, because mental health is proeminent as CVD and cancer screening and diabetes. So I, I could see some some correspondence, except here, mental health is first, probably because, again, I didn't uh, extract from the symposium on mental health. Now, I calculated the number of voters, and to try to see, you know, are we doing this as a team for each of these projects, or is this a silo uh, a job, or a, a dyad job, or... So, the mean was 6.8 members for people flag as co-presenter. No, I didn't uh, take into account if you have your name with a team name, because I didn't know I'm in the team. But it was interesting to see the range. So there was one presentation, oral, it was one person, uh, Professor Paul. It was from La. And the winner at 32, all listed name by name, and it was for theory development. And more, uh, more interestingly here, it was from the Omera group, who's uh, developing a theory. The second uh, contender was uh, the theory development for the tree top model, 23. And uh, the third one for, was from uh, Ollie Whitman work with the engagement measure in develop, decision and development. So that's interesting because it seems that developing theory is quite high intensive in resources, maybe much more than a cluster randomized trial in 16 provinces. <laughs> You need more brain power. As for the countries of the author, so again, the 10 most frequently observed, and I'm very, very sorry, again, if I forget to put you know, countries who came for only one, but just again to give, give us a, a, a guess. So USA with 31st uh, entry, Netherlands, Canada, Australia, UK, Germany, Malaysia, Denmark, France, a note of caution, does not include the French-speaking symposium, so that would have certainly boost the number. And again, I'm giving you a bit of a benchmark with the, the, the characteristic of those included study in, I, uh, in our uh, updated Cochrane, because again, that's uh, quite correlated, because you see that uh, most study we found on implementation of solution making came from the US, second position Germany, Canada, UK, Netherlands. So there's again some um, correspondence here. And the other thing I was interested because of the discussion and the presentation by Martin, uh, who we are and where we come from and where is it that it's emerging or not yet emerging, is I was trying to get, again, it's uh, listed in the uh, abstract, uh, which type of countries are working with which, which country to see if there was something unusual we could have picked up or there was a, a signal. So, uh, it, so, so the way I've posted it here is when the first hotel came from that country, the others are like the secondary or third hotel and could even be the senior hotel. So we see that Australia seems to work a lot with Canada, UK, France. Canada with UK, USA, Netherlands, Germany, Australia. USA with UK, Netherlands, Germany, Australia, Poland. UK, USA, Canada, Finland, Norway. And then it goes down and down. But again, that could be for us to foresee the future interesting to understand that there seems to be clusters that are quite um, uh, institutionalized and maybe this is worthwhile to keep in mind. So as a brief summary, uh, it's a, as we see it's a conference with very diversified research team. It seems to be moving more and more into implementation. Implementation of decision aid is clearly delineated or distinguished from implementation of solution making, which you know validates uh, the paper that uh, has uh, clearly uh, stated this. The patient experience language is moving up, and that's for <coughs> someone like me coming from Canada and North America, very congruent with what we're here right now. So the strategy for patient-oriented research, the AAA, patient-reported uh, PRAMs and PROMs. The interprofessional idea is moving slowly. Study design are still very much cross-sectional. I have nothing against that, but I think we need to also reflect on that. There's some very diversified clinical area, including not specified. Um, it seems that, as I said, for theory development, you really need a lot of brains. 
and I'm not surprised. And countries most represented are still high-income countries, and some countries seem to be OBS. But there's many limitation, only oral abstract, no pretension that it represented the poster. The teams are very aggregated at a very high level, and only one extractor, and this extractor was very sleepy. <laughs> so obviously, uh, uh, it has had an impact for sure. So maybe very little preliminary conclusion is giving very diversified research team, and again with the discussion yesterday, and the fact there's many clinical areas that are diversified uh, in the methods, I think this group is quite attractive because usually when you go in a big conference for a specific group, it's, it tends to be quite um, uh, specific with not as much diversity. So I would understand that everybody at least would feel that they have a home here because they come here with so diverse uh, background in terms of research team, clinical area and methods that this is to certainly an attractive aspect of this group. Implementation work translate into collaborating, uh, could translate into collaborating more with the implementation Kitty research group. Patient experience is gaining in importance, what I mentioned. Poor reporting made the, the, the work a little bit harder. So that would be, I think I would like to maybe suggest that there could be a way of structuring the, the abstract because in fact, that could be a way you could extract data and help build the, the knowledge base of this field. And as you, some of you know, when you do a systematic review of some sort, sometimes you need to go in proceedings, so that would be easier for you to do. Uh, theory development is very resource intensive, but I think the question is to be asked and should be discussed, is and can solution making be made relevant to low and middle income country? Because that was a discussion also that happened in one session where this seems to be born out of very specific country, high income. So is this something that can be translated? Um, I don't have the answer. So food for thought, and that will be my last maybe uh, nugget, is um, in another environment with the knowledge translation uh, people who uh, meet uh, with um, the KU, they once uh, welcomed to their conferences uh, Michael Gibbons, who has wrote about new form of pro uh, knowledge production, uh, because he called, he distinguished mode one and mode two. And the mode two was what actually was uh, referring to when you look at the crowd of people interested in knowledge translation research, because he said that, you know, it's distinguishable from transitional research, and he kind of put a word of caution that when sometimes you move into mode one and you institutionalize and make something very specific, you may lose some of the multidisciplinary aspect and approach. So it's just food for thought and word of caution. So now I'm entering in the second, uh, the, the, the last part, the, the, the third part, which is what could we contribute to the changing landscape of health and social care research from where I come from and what I understand my policymaker and um, public patient constitution would like to see from us. So some of you know that my first uh, career, if I had ever one, <laughs> was architecture. So I use it sometimes because in Canada, it's not like in some country of the world, you have snow, cold, and you have to build your house so you know your foundation won't crack and uh, make your house disappear. So foundation, no. it starts with the fact that I tweeted it that uh, most countries, many countries, not only high-income countries, Minister of Health met in Paris not long ago and said that there's a problem. The healthcare system and social care system is not, is not patient-centered. And now they understand at, the, at this high policy level how important this is. So that's one of the things that policymakers are asking us. We know also that we are the expert of the gray zone of decision making. So everybody knows, I would say, this pie from the BMG clinical evidence. I won't explain it. And we also know from the group uh, of researchers, uh, with some uh, very well represented here, with uh, Tammy Hoffman uh, from Bonn University and uh, Paul Glasiu, that there is humongous waste in research. And that's also something that policymakers, sometimes we, we tend to see them as stupid, but they're not that stupid. So uh, they, they kind of also pick that up. So what this waste and research is also making us reflect upon is we should start very early on in the process of research to engage patients and the public so they could prioritize questions. 
And this is why the James Lynn Alliance initiative and the presentation that was made here is so exciting. Because when you look at research priorities, when they are identified by clinicians uh, working in the war zone and patient, and you see them under the left uh, bar histogram, so the James Lynn Alliance, uh, you see that they would like research on education, training, service delivery, psychological, etc. Things we're very good at. But if you leave it and you don't involve these people to prioritize research and you leave it to non-commercial, uh, uh, let's say, uh, organization or commercial, you see that the ratio is changing very fast because obviously there is uh, some uh, underground agenda that these, uh, these organizations, very rightly so, will want to fund. So can we solve the footing problems? We have uh, the pretension, if Canadians can have only one in their life, is uh, we think that the strategy for patient-oriented research may be, may be possibly a way. Uh, some of us in the room here, I'm thinking of Ali Whitman and Ila Blanc, are very involved into this, and uh, there's some debate. But it's really a, uh, a willingness to try, to try hard. I don't know if it's as hard as it could, to really ensuring that the right patient will see the right intervention at the right time, and that there is a continuum of research that engage patient as partner. It helps them identify with us the priorities, and obviously we want to improve their outcome. And for those of you who know the framework of uh, Carman, just to let you know that it would be easy to add a foundational part of it, which is the patient-oriented research, where with the right down uh, column, you really have us, the expert of shared decision making and leadership, playing a very important role. Because when you identify the research question, asking clinician and patient, and the UK has been the leader, in fact, it's a process whereby clinicians and patients work together to agree which research question matter most and deserve priority attention. So again, that was a very, again, I think nice uh, uh, presentation that was uh, linking well uh, the tradition making uh, knowledge base and uh, this very precocious involvement of patient in research. So how does this align also more even clearly with policy in Canada and please Canadians here in the room you can say if you agree or not and you can be very ashamed of me you have the right but the first thing right now is to know that Canada means village. If you have to ask for your citizenship in Canada and you go for this exam and they ask you the question, what does Canada stand for? Apparently it stands for the fact that when Jacques Cartier came in 1534 and set foot on the east coast of Canada called Quebec and he met First Nation indigenous people, they said Canada. And he thought that he discovered Canada. But in fact, they were inviting him to his village. So Ali is very active into this. But in Canada, you always now, and thanks to people like, to, uh, like Ali, will um, thank uh, the people who were there before us and who actually had the land uh, and were welcoming us to their Canada village. Because the priority number one, for those of you who read The Guardian or any other newspaper that are still free on the web, is reconciliation, because we're going through a very difficult time where uh, the uh, First Nation, although not outnumbering the non-First Nation, have the worst health and social uh, indicator and uh, really uh, are in the, uh, a process of extinction if we don't do something. So that's policy making uh, uh, number one uh, priority. And in fact, Prince Charles came to Canada Day last Saturday and he landed in Equalot uh, to, uh, to, to highlight this importance in our policy making environment. Would you agree, Ali? Am I making a mistake here? So that's the number one priority. And this is why I would like to highlight the work by Janet Joel, who's working with this population, and now Gary Groot in Saskatchewan, because some of our provinces in Canada have a very uh, large uh, population of, uh, of Aboriginal people. And it's a, a totally another way of working with them. Priority number two 
is really engaging patients and the public in all public affairs, including research prioritization and processes at the federal level and at the provincial level. And in fact, last week, uh, the province of Quebec uh, uh, finalized a process, a web-based process. There was a platform, and for about, I don't know if it was six or, six, six or eight weeks, our scientific in chief of the province would go public a newspaper and say, please go log and put your research priority. And they did a meeting, and he said that in the fall, they're going to take this information, and this will feed the research priority of the next maybe four or five years if the current government stay in place. And priority number three is equality matters. So all types of equality, because there's not only equality in terms of sex and gender or culture, but there's multiple. And for those of you who are interested, there's a nice framework called the Progress Framework that can inform you on all the multiple way of uh, uh, equality and equity, but for us researchers, I mentioned this to some of you, there's some competition now that we do in Canada and we need to do a tutorial online, prove that we passed the class on sex and gender issue before we applied for the grant. Okay? And Justin Trudeau, our minister, said that he's aiming at 50-50, so that's something that's really like, coloring and nuancing very much what we're doing. So where next? So where are we? And I learned about this this week because um, we're celebrating 150th anniversary and the research chair program has launched a very ambitious program called the Research Chair Canada 150. It's singling, it's, a, it's aiming only at international people and it's a seven years program. It runs from 350,000 Canadian to 1 million Canadian a year for seven years. So any one of you here who is interested, come and talk to me, Ali, or any other Canadian, or spread the word. So Canada is already. Are you happy with this, Ali? With this program? Because she's very, she's very well uh, connected. The other thing I wanted to say is, uh, because some of you have asked me, so yes, in the Laval, our group would be very happy and wel uh, to welcome you in 2019, but we will let the group decide if this is what they want to do, but it's out there, it's a proposition. So if you want to come to Quebec City, uh, there's a, a group of us who are uh, very uh, delighted to uh, welcome you, and we promise it's not going to be during winter time. <laughs> And my very last slide is, if you cannot and don't do it, and you don't actually pick uh, to come to Quebec or you cannot come, I'd like to just extend again my invitation to you for this conference. Actually, Guylaine Terriot uh, is in the room. She's a, a VP at the uh, Medical Association of Quebec. So again, the, the story here is Canada is celebrating 150. But the Medical Canadian Association of Canada is also doing this same birthday. And they were born in Quebec City, so they thought they would uh, support this conference. And again, we have uh, uh, great confidence that this group has a lot to offer, and the Minister of Health will open the conference, and policymaker will be there to uh, hear uh, what we have to say. So thank you very much, and safe trip home. Bye-bye. <laughs>